Hey guys, let's hover the Gazelle. So the Gazelle is possibly the easiest helicopter to hover in DCS thanks to its auto hover functionality, which I'm shamelessly abusing right now. Um, but it's also the most difficult to hover, and that's in part due to its very small size, but also due to a couple of module specific issues, which we'll get into as we go. For those not familiar with my channel already, this video will be a bit of a deep dive. So we're not just gonna look at here's where you put your controls to keep yourself in the air, but also talk about some of the helicopter flight dynamics and the theories and concepts behind that, uh, that will hopefully give you a better understanding of not just what to do, but why to do them and what your helicopter is trying to tell you. So these will be things like ground effect and torque effect, translating tendency and so on. For those who are familiar with my channel, especially if you've seen my Mi 8 tutorials already, a lot of this stuff will be stuff you already know, and uh, if you want to skip ahead, of course, the chapters are in the seek bar below, so go ahead and do that if you like. Otherwise, please stick around, and I hope you guys enjoy. So what is torque effect? So torque effect is the influence of the engine and transmission's torque on the movement of the helicopter body. And practically what that means for us is that as the engine, engine and transmission rotate the rotor disc, the blades, around in one direction, it will cause the helicopter's body or fuselage to tend to twist in the opposite direction. So if I slow down time here, you can see pretty clearly which way the rotor disc in the Gazelle rotates. It's clockwise the same as the hip. So if you're familiar with those videos or if you're familiar with a helicopter, everything's going to, going to be basically the same. Um, if you're coming from the Huey, it's going to be the opposite. Whenever I talk about left or right, it'll be the opposite from that bird. Um, but what we're looking at here is as this rotor disc rotates around to the right, from the front to the right to the back, the nose of the helicopter is going to be pushed from the front to the left to the back. It's going to twist anti-clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, this is torque effect, and we can test this in a couple of pretty simple ways. So from the cockpit here, you've got my controls indicator up at the top right, or top left, sorry. And if I just reset all my controls and recenter my anti-torque pedals, and then just lift up, what should happen is you should see that torque effect cause the nose to twist around to the left. So let's bring in some collective, and up we go, and already you can see that is the case. So now we can counter that out by adding in some right anti-torque pedal. So I'll bring in some of that, and then this time as I lift up, now the nose isn't going crazy. Now, as I add more collective, I'm basically asking the engine and transmission for more power. And as that happens, it's going to generate more torque, which is going to cause the nose to twist again. So if I leave the pedals where they are now, and then just bring in more collective, we start twisting to the left. And then as I reduce that collective and ask for less torque, that twisting stops. And if I reduce it enough, it'll actually twist back the other way. But I don't have the altitude to demonstrate that at the moment. So that's basically torque effect, and that's why we call the pedals. There we go. That's why we call the pedals in the helicopter anti-torque and not rudder, because they're not controlling a rudder, they're counteracting the effects of torque from the engine and transmission on the fuselage of the helicopter. So what the anti-torque pedals are controlling is the tail rotor, or in this helicopter, the fenestrum, which is basically a tail rotor that is stuck in the middle here of this vertical stabilizer, this tail fin. And it's inside and it's protected. And they call that a fenestrum. So practically speaking, it doesn't operate too much differently from a regular old tail rotor. It's assemb the assembly is a little different to uh, make that work the way it does, but otherwise it has the same function. It moves the tail either left or right in order to bring the nose around and keep it pointed where you want. So that's pretty much it for torque effect. Uh, let's move on and talk about ground effect. So 
So what is ground effect? So ground effect is a state of flight close to the ground where the air being pulled in from above the rotor disc and pushed downwards begins to collide with the ground below you. At this point, that air can't continue downwards and needs to now be pushed out to the sides to make room for more air being pulled in from above. This basically creates a sort of pocket or bubble or cushion of air below you, which practically speaking eases the power requirements for staying airborne at that altitude. This means that we can do things like get off the ground with more weight on board or at higher altitudes or um, at higher temperatures than we could without ground effect present. It means that you could be in a state, uh, you could load up your helicopter so much that you could only hover while a couple of meters off the ground benefiting from ground effect. And if you were to climb any higher than that, you would not be able to sustain a hover anymore. So it's a good thing to have, and uh, we should make use of it whenever possible. Now, when does ground effect take into effect? When does it come into play? That's determined by the diameter of your rotor disc. In the gazelle, your rotor disc is about 10 meters. That means uh, that you should feel that ground effect will come into play from zero to about 10 meters of altitude. But it's not just on or off, it's sort of a um, it'll fade as you begin to climb. The lower to the ground you are, the stronger the effect will be, and then as you climb, it will get weaker and weaker. Typically, I tend to notice the ground effect when I'm flying up to about half of the rotor diameter. So in this case, I would notice it up to about five meters in the air. For comparison, the Mi-8 hip has a rotor diameter of over 20 meters, and you can feel ground effect pretty strongly up to over 10. So we're looking at half that, less than half that, in the gazelle. And it, uh, it definitely does change things. You will hear some people mention that ground effect appears to be weak in the gazelle. That may or may not be the case, but uh, I've, as we're going to demonstrate in a moment, you should be able to feel ground effect at 5 meters pretty reasonably. If you're not, well, it's probably related to other challenges, which we'll talk about later. Okay, so to demonstrate ground effect, we're going to do some hovering at different altitudes. We're going to look at how much power is required, how much collective is required to do so. So a couple of things to be watching for, if I just pause it here. We're going to be paying attention to our collective percentage here. And you're going to find that it's sitting just shy of about 60% right now. And we're also looking at our uh, climb and descent right here to tell us whether we are climbing or descending. We want to have that right at about zero uh, to indicate that we're in a hover. Oops. So you've got the altitude very clearly on the info bar down at the bottom of the screen at about 104, 103 meters here. Try to bring that back up, get ourselves leveled out. So right about there, I pause it again. So about 60% collective at 100 meters. So let's drop down to half that. Alright, so about 50 meters. Get ourselves into a hover. Now let's have a look at our required power to stay hovering here. So you can see we're not climbing or descending. And our required power is, again, just shy of 60%. So it hasn't changed much, and of course it will increase as altitude increases because the air gets thinner, uh, but it should be fairly minor. We should see it be somewhere around 60%, especially for the kind of altitudes we're at right now, the kind of differences we're looking at. So let's come down again. Just there, about 23, 24, and we'll reduce it a little, 25. So again, we're not climbing or descending. And our collective requirement is about 56% or so. So let's come down a little. Now let's drop down into ground effect. And because our motor diameter is only about 10 meters, we've got to get uh, below 10 meters altitude. All right, so at 10 meters, again, we're not climbing or descending, and our requirements are Again, about 57, 58% here. So they haven't changed much right at the edge of ground effect. So you can see that all the way from 10 meters to just over 100 meters, our collective requirements 
really don't change a lot. They're in between 56 and 59, basically the entire time. Let's come down more. Five. And then we have a look at there. We're just descending very slightly, but our collective requirements are now 50%. So in that five meters that we descended, we've lost 5% of the required power needed to stay airborne. If I get myself down here over the uh, pavement, it'll be better. Climb back. If I can hover here below five meters, pause it again. This one's a little better. Yeah, 45%. So we're off the ground and hovering at a couple of meters at just 45% collective. So there's your demonstration that as you get close to the ground, your power requirements go down to stay airborne or to get airborne because you have that cushion of air beneath you, thanks to ground effect. So what is translating tendency? So translating tendency is the uh, tendency of the helicopter to any single rotor helicopter, I should specify here to drift constantly in one direction because of its tail rotor, or in this case, finestrin. So the Gazelle is very much like the HIP, as I mentioned before, and if I slow down time again, you can see that main rotor is rotating clockwise. And we talked about how torque effect will cause the nose of the body of the helicopter to then rotate anti-clockwise or counterclockwise. And the tail rotor or finestrin exists to counteract that. So the tail rotor, and I, I apologize, I'm just going to call it a tail rotor. I use the two interchangeably um, far too often. Anyway, um, the tail rotor is basically the same as the main rotor. And the main rotor is pulling in air from above and pushing it down, which causes the helicopter to lift up in the same direction that the air is being, same place the air is being pulled from. The tail rotor is the same thing, but sideways. And so it's always pulling in air from one side, in this case from the left, and pushing it out to the right which causes the tail rotor to not only rotate in that direction to the left, but also it causes the entire fuselage or the entire body of the helicopter to drift that direction because it's generating lift. And so it's kind of pulling the entire helicopter in that direction all the time. So we counteract that in flight and in hover by adding just a small amount of right cyclic. And that basically cancels the two out and then you can fly straight. So the helicopter will always be just a little bit tilted to the right and sometimes in some helicopters, you'll see they'll either pre-tilt the mast or whatever in order to allow you to fly um, wings level. Um, but if they don't do that, then what you'll see is one skid will sort of hang low and it'll be in this helicopter, it'll be the right skid, which will hang low. And that's because the pilot is counteracting the translating tendency from the tail rotor finestrin. Okay, so to demonstrate translating tendency, all I'm gonna do is just lift up into the air. I'm going to manipulate the pitch axis on my cyclic, but I'm going to leave the roll axis centered. And then we'll see where we go. So I bring in our collective. Up we go. So I'll keep the nose pointed straight with my anti-torque pedals, and then just use pitch up and down to try to keep myself from flying forward or backward. And now look where we're going. We are drifting very heavily left. And you can see my controls indicator. That's not from cyclic. I'm not touching my cyclic at all right now. That is strictly from the tail rotor or the finestra. Now, if I bring in some right cyclic, tilt the helicopter this way, I can counteract that. And then ideally I would find the sort of sweet spot and trim it out where I could then center my physical controls and I would not be drifting all over the place anymore. So that is translating tendency and you will encounter that during hovers and, as, and during forward flight, though it will be less prevalent in forward flight compared to hovers because the, uh, the aerodynamics of the fuselage of the body of the helicopter will assist in keeping the helicopter sort of straight and not let it drift quite as much. So let's talk about how we get off the ground in the first place. Now in a helicopter, you don't typically want to just 
reef on the collective right from nothing all the way up. It's a great way to overstress your engine or to find out the hard way that there's something hooked around your skid or you have some other problem or whatever. It's a great way to get yourself into trouble. Instead, what you want to do is introduce just enough power, just enough collective, that you are what's called light on skids. And this is a state where the weight of the helicopter is no longer resting on the skids, but they're still touching the ground. Instead, the weight is now being supported by your rotor disc. It's lifting you, but it's not lifting you up entirely off the ground. So we'll bring in some collective here, and depending on your loadout, depending on the weather, your altitude, all that kind of stuff, uh, that's probably going to happen somewhere at or just after 40% collective. And the way you'll know it is that you'll start to drift around on your skids without leaving the ground. Now I'm still on active pause, so we'll take that off. And bring it up to about 40% collective again, and there it is. And you can see I'm already starting to drift around. And you can drift either way. Now be very careful in this state because you're also at your least stable. And if you were to, say, slip sideways and bump one of those blue little lights in the taxiway over there, you could tip over in something that's called dynamic rollover, which I'm not going to get into in this video. Just be aware that you are not super stable in the state. You should spend a minimal amount of time here if you can help it. But get yourself into the state where you're light on skids. You can make a few last minute corrections to your trim if you need to. In this helicopter, I really don't recommend doing much of anything, just get yourself light and then bring in a little more collective to come up. And it's such a tiny amount, especially in this helicopter. And again, depending on the wind, the stronger the wind, the less power you're going to need. But you're going to go from like 40% to 43 or 44% tops. And under my current configuration, I'm clean with half gas, so pretty light. But that's pretty much it. Just uh, bring in enough collective so that you start to drift a little bit on your skids, so you're light, and then a little more to get into the air. And that last little bit, that's the kicker. you got to do that. It's such a small movement for this helicopter that you don't launch into the air like an RC helicopter. So next I wanted to talk about the importance of wind, direction, and magnitude on your hovering. Uh, to do this I also need to cover something very briefly called effective translational lift. I'm not going to get too deep into this one because that's not really the point of this video, but it is important to understand it. Um, basically the concept is once you get above a certain airspeed, the body or the fuselage of the helicopter begins to act as a lifting surface. Now if you look at the very back of the helicopter, I've got those nice tail stabilizers there, which basically look like wings on an airplane, and they begin to add lift like an airplane's wings do, along with just the general body of the helicopter becoming, like I said, a bit of a lifting surface. So um, practically for you what this means is that once you get above a certain airspeed, you don't need quite as much collective anymore, quite as much power to stay airborne. And that's a good thing. Um, we, we, take a, we take advantage of that for heavier liftoffs, for general, gentle liftoffs and landings, and all kinds of other great things. Uh, but the important thing about this is that airspeed and wind speed are essentially the same thing. And so zero wind and 30 kph ground speed is basically the same as um, 30 kilometers per hour winds with zero ground speed. So just hovering in a 30 kph wind is the same as flying along at 30 kph without any wind. Does that make sense? Because it's still the same amount of air washing over the rotor at the same speed. That's important when we're hovering because the sort of magic number for effective translational lift is right around that 30 kph mark. So right around 30 kilometers per hour of airspeed, whether that's the wind speed or your um, forward ground speed combined, if they are around 30 kph or greater, you're going to have effective translational lift helping you out. So typically in a hover, we don't have it because we're not going fast enough and 30 kph winds are pretty strong. But if we do have winds that strong, it means we're going to be able to hover with significantly less collective. That also sounds like a great thing until you remember that winds in real life are a little different from winds in DCS. Uh, winds in DCS are pretty consistent, so the wind is coming from directly behind the camera, pointing at the nose, and I can rely on it to always be that direction and that magnitude, and it really doesn't fluctuate much. 
In reality, wind changes. It gusts, it increases and decreases in magnitude, and it will change directions. So sometimes it'll come from over here, and then it'll come from over here, and then it'll come back from the middle again. And so it's not nearly as reliable or predictable. And so getting yourself into a situation where you're hovering with effective translational lift, or ETL, can actually be a dangerous thing. So imagine you're hovering here with ETL at a lower collective percentage because you don't require as much power to stay in the air, and then the wind shifts. Now you don't have ETL anymore because you're not pointed directly into the wind. Your, uh, your lifting surfaces on the helicopter aren't doing their job from here. You're nowhere near as aerodynamic. And now you've lost ETL. Now you begin to drop, and you need to respond to that by adding more collective. Then the wind comes back, and now you have too much collective, and you start climbing. And it becomes this sort of dance of trying to uh, balance the state in and out of ETL. I want to say in and out, but that's not correct. Uh, achieving ETL and losing ETL constantly, and that's kind of a dangerous state to be in. So we're going to demonstrate that a little bit here in a moment. Um, but I just wanted to say that the rule of thumb for hovering is at lower wind conditions, you want to hover nose into the wind. At higher wind conditions, you know, 30 kph or greater or anywhere near that area, really, you probably want to hover something like this, where you're not going to have ETL helping you, and you don't have to worry so much about the wind fluctuating because you're not going to have it either way. Okay, so for the demo, we've got the wind set to about 9 meters per second, which is just a little over 30 kilometers per hour. Uh, and we're going to hover pointed directly into the wind. You can see the wind sock is up there. And we should have ETL like immediately on takeoff. And we should be able to hover at a much lower uh, percentage of collective. So we'll bring that in. We've got ourselves light on skids, which is going to happen a lot sooner now. It's going to happen at 30 kph, and I'm starting to drift backwards a bit here. So if we bring in just a little more collective now, up we go. And like we're hovering at 5 meters now at 32% collective. That wasn't even enough previously to get light on skids, so that shows you already the difference that wind can make just on your hovering. So now this is all fine and good in GCS. We can hover into the wind at uh, this attitude just fine because wind is pretty predictable and reliable in GCS. But if uh, the wind were to shift or we were to turn, and we lose ETL, now I'm sinking. And if I turn completely sideways, now I'm sinking again. And so we want to avoid the situation where the helicopter is going to be gaining and losing ETL all the time and sinking and climbing. We really want to be consistently out of it. You know, we can manage our collective and not have to worry about it. So now I can bring in a little extra collective. I'm going to have it hit me up the flank here. I'm drifting all over the place. There, on really strong days, we want to hover something like this. You know, we're getting us from the Okay, so we have to talk about a couple of the challenges that face the Gazelle specifically. Um, for this one, I've enlisted the help of my webcam and my co-pilot. You can see here, so that you can see the movement of my physical joystick in relation to the virtual controls indicator. That's that red diamond up in the top left. So you can see full forward deflection. It's all the way up on the diamond. Full aft, full left, and full right. All right, so the first issue in the Gazelle um, is the hypersensitive controls. If you've watched my Mi 8 hip tutorial videos, particularly the ones about taking off and hovering, you'll know that the takeoff trim position is a little bit aft and a little bit right, somewhere about here. And so what you do is you trim to about this position, the diamond just kind of floating out here, not touching either of the axis lines. You trim there, and then you recenter your stick, and then you take off and you make little adjustments from that point. The trim takeoff position in the Gazelle is probably about there. Like it's such a small movement, it's basically imperceptible. So there's the center point and there. 
That's it. That's the whole movement you make to trim it for takeoff. So let's get in the air and uh, let's see. Up we go, and yeah, um, I needed a little bit more right cyclic, maybe a little bit of aft cyclic. But my movements are, like, you've got the camera there, you can see, can you see the joystick move at all? I'm touching the grip with just my thumb and two or three fingertips, and that's all. And all the movements, I'm not moving my hand, I'm just um, moving my fingertips a little bit. And that's it. It's such a small movement. Now this is with a 20 centimeter extension on a VKB stick. If you're flying on something less precise, or that doesn't have an extension, or that has a stiff centering spring, or has a big dead zone, it's going to be a very different and challenging experience. For example, something like my old X56 here, which has a dead zone in the center. It's got a bunch of center slop here, so you have to add anywhere from a 5 to 10% dead zone because it just kind of wobbles around in the center point and can't be relied on very well. And then you hit the spring tension and you have to push through that, and you've already made too big of a motion. Just going like that to kind of um, get the stick moving out of its center point is now too much of a movement. So trying to hover in this thing compared to this thing is a very different experience. Look at the difference in full deflection forward versus full deflection forward. Look at the range of motion that I have. All the way forward, all the way forward. Let this one snap back versus that. So it's, it's a marked difference, and if you're flying on an older stick or something like that one, it's going to be even more challenging than it is for me just with this little bit of fingertip movement here. So we're going to talk about what we can do to alleviate that. All right, so let's go into our controls menu, and uh, we'll have a look. Okay, so we're in the controls menu, and uh, I like this foldable view up here. Then you can go into access commands, and then you're looking for flight control collective, Cyclic pitch, cyclic roll, and rudder, which should be anti-torque, but whatever. Um, we're going to go into the pitch and the roll first. So on your device, so on my VKB, I'm going to right-click on flight control cyclic pitch, go into tune combo axis. Now, right now, what we've got is just a linear one-to-one. -one. So full deflection is uh, on the physical stick is full deflection on the virtual axis. We want to reduce that. We need more precision around that center point, especially. And one way to do that would be to add a curve. So you could put yourself in, a, say, a plus 20 or something curve, and you'll get more precision around that center point where a larger movement of your physical stick translates to a smaller movement of the virtual, of the in-game joystick. But then as you get towards the extreme ends of the axis, then it flips the other way. And so curves kind of create this weird behavior and muck with your muscle memory a bit because it's not linear response anymore. So personally, I wouldn't recommend it. Personally, what I would do is... Uh, put your curves back to about zero and then reduce your saturation y value and we're going to bring this down to about 40 percent now the reasoning here is that during flight in the gazelle during normal flight you won't use about half of that axis if not more uh, you just will not have a reason to do full deflection in any direction ever because the controls are so sensitive your movements are all so small so if we just say cut down the size of that axis by half or a little more then we could make some larger movements on our physical joystick still retain the one-to-one -one linear response all the way through the axis but have more control over the helicopter so that's all i've done there is i've basically said the extreme the outer 60 percent of this axis just get rid of it so now 100 percent deflection on my physical joystick is only 40 percent deflection of the in-game virtual joystick We're going to do the exact same thing to the cyclic roll, tune combo axis, reduce saturation Y down to about 40%. And then our roll axis now works the same way. We can push the joystick all the way left and it will only be seen in game as about 40% deflection. For our collective and our rudder, it's the opposite. 
So in this case, we're going to go into our collective, go into tune combo axis. Now we could do reduce saturation here, but the problem is you actually need the full range of deflection. You need to be able to go from zero collective to a hundred. And if you reduce the saturation, you're only able to go from, you know, um, 25 to 75, for example, and that would be really bad. You wouldn't be able to fly effectively or land ever. So we need that full saturation on the axis, but we can put in a curve. Now, if we put in a positive curve, what's going to happen is we're going to be more precise when the throttles around the center point where a larger movement around the throttle center is a smaller movement in the in game virtual cockpit. But that's typically not the problem with the with the collective or the throttle axis in the gazelle. Typically, the problem is that you're launching straight into the air, like an RC helicopter. Uh, and it's very hard to take off smoothly. And so we want that precision at the extreme ends at zero in particular. And so what we do is we put a negative curve on it instead, about negative 20. Um, and then now as you're taking off, you're going to be able to make larger movements on your physical controller, your throttle, to do a smaller movement on the in-game collective axis. So this should allow you to take off a little bit smoother. And then it doesn't matter quite so much that you have uh, less precision around the center point and then more around the edges that you'll kind of get used to. It doesn't matter as much, but the extra precision around the uh, zero to 15, 20, 30% here is really nice. Finally, for the rudder or the anti-torque pedals, uh, this one, if we go into tune combo axis, this one, we do want the precision around the center point because that's mostly where we're maneuvering. So for this one, we want the positive axis about plus 20, and that'll give us more precision right around the center point. So we can make bigger movements on the physical pedals or a twist axis. If you have one, this is especially where this is useful. Um, a larger input on your twist axis will give you a smaller movement of the nose in game. So this is really good. And then you still want the full range so that you can still do full deflection left or right. They're going to find situations where you need that. But this will give you a little more precision around the center point if you're struggling to keep the nose pointed without it going all over the place due to say a twist axis or something like that all right so let's uh let's jump back into the game and we'll try hovering with those inputs instead and see how that compares all right so we've got the webcam back um now you can't really see the pedals as much and you can't really see the throttle but i can definitely demonstrate with the joystick so before it was full deflection forward on the stick was full deflection or uh, all the way up on that diamond on the virtual indicator. Now you can see it's not even halfway up, it's 40% up. Same idea here, all the way back only translates to 40% of the movement. All the way left and all the way right. This means that now we can make much larger inputs around the center point with our physical joystick without flipping the helicopter over and going nuts. So remember the position for taking off in the hip that was about here? With the diamond kind of floating out on its own? Remember that it was just, I could still grab the joystick um, with my fingertips and just kind of close my hand and that was enough to bring the joystick to the right position. Now, if I let go and it recenters, I can still reach the joystick, but I can't quite, like, it's really hard to kind of grab it. And then to bring it all the way in, it's all the way over here. So I'm almost forced to move my hand if I can't quite reach it like this I could yeah I have to move my hand just to get this to come all the way out here so it's quite a marked difference and this will help you a lot if you're flying something like the old x56 joystick I have or a Logitech Extreme 3D Pro or something so now our trim position to get into the air is still tiny but at least you can actually see that movement of the joystick it's somewhere around here. And then the same with the pedals. We've got more travel of the pedals around the center point. Now, if I go smoothly from the left side to the right side, you can see how it went quickly. Now it's going slowly, and then it's going to go quickly again. That's because of that curve we set. It's fast at the edges, and then there's more precision here in the middle, and then fast again at the other side. So this gives me more control over keeping the nose pointed where I want it which is really nice for a twist axis. And then finally for the throttle, I'm gonna throw it on active pause so I can show you and the same idea there. It's, um, it's the opposite of the pedals. It moves really slow at the beginning, then really fast in the middle, and then really slow at the top end again. And so I have more precision here and um, less in the center.
but that's fine. That should help me take off a little smoother. So we get ourselves trimmed, um, get ourselves in position for takeoff here, move the cyclic just a little bit right and just a little bit aft, not much at all. Some right anti-torque, and then we bring in our uh, throttle or collective, about 40% light on skids. And then as we come up, it's a much smoother liftoff than it was before. And now the movements I'm making to correct are a little more visible. And I'm, I'm making more inputs than I need to here on purpose, but you can see the size of the actual physical deflection of my joystick is considerably more now, much more pronounced, for much less movement of the cockpit. So now I can make these little adjustments a lot easier without completely flipping the helicopter upside down. Okay, so there's one more issue that faces Gazelle owners, and that's a bug uh, on the cyclic return rate. Now, this might impact your decision to put in those axis modifications that I just showed you, and we'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, basically, the bug goes as follows. So this is an analog flight controls uh, helicopter. It means that the cyclic is physically linked to the control surfaces so that the swashplate and the other and everything else should respond as fast as I can move the joystick. So if I want to roll really quickly, I can just shove the joystick all the way left or all the way right. And if I want to pitch up really quick, same thing. I can shove the joystick in whichever direction and it should respond very quickly. And it does. The problem is on the return. Because they're physically linked, I should also just be able to bring it back to center and those flight, those uh, control surfaces will return to their original position just as quickly. So if I commanded a right roll and then I undo it, it should come back to center pretty quick. Same thing for left or for pitch. The bug is that it doesn't do that. So I'll command, say, a, a pitch up of the nose and the nose will come up. And then as I, I'll let my, my joystick return to center, that nose is gonna kinda hang here, and then it will slowly return to center at a very fixed rate, like this. And it will slowly come back down. And if I want it to come down any slower than that, I have to command pitch nose down this way. I have to push my cyclic forward to bring the nose down any faster. That's not the way it's supposed to work, and what it results in is if I wanted to bring the nose up for just a moment and then bring it right back down, I should just be able to bring the cyclic back and then put it back to center. Instead, I have to bring the cyclic back, bring it back to center, cross the axis in the other direction, and then bring it back to center again. So let's have a look at what that actually looks like. So we're flying along here and I'm just gonna bring the nose up and then I'm gonna let go of my cyclic entirely and that nose just stays up and it slowly comes back down to center. The same goes if I nose it down. See how it just kind of sticks where I left it? It responds to adding deflection, but not to removing it. And then the nose slowly comes back up. And the same is true if I add a little bit of right bank and let go, it holds that and slowly comes back to center. Same for left bank. And if I want to undo that any faster, I need to deflect in the opposite direction because it kind of sticks. And so that results in that motion I was mentioning earlier, where if I wanted to bring the nose up for just a moment and then bring it back, I have to go aft cyclic center, forward cyclic center, aft cyclic center, forward cyclic center. I shouldn't have to do the second motion at all. I should just be doing aft cyclic center and it should come back. So Casmo in his video didn't think this was a big deal. To him, it's not a big deal at all. It was just something he needed to adjust to and figured he could just move on with it. That's fine. Um, for me personally, I think it is a big deal. I think it's the single biggest reason that I don't fly the gazelle very often because it's fighting my muscle memory because I'm making these large movements across the center point, over correcting all the time, trying to get the helicopter to do what I want. I shouldn't have to deflect both directions just to make a single movement. I'm making twice as many movements across twice the distance with my cyclic. And it's just not an enjoyable experience for me. So if they could fix that one bug, I would fly this helicopter more than I do, which is almost never these days. Um, 
yeah, that's that's pretty much it for that bug. Um, how it relates to the last thing, the axis modifications, is pretty simply that if you are increasing the throw distance to um, for to allow that increased precision around the center point, you're also going to increase the amount of cyclic throw you're doing to undo when the axis or when the deflection sticks and the cyclic doesn't want to come back to center. So for me to bring the nose down and then bring it back up, like that's a pretty big movement that I'm doing there. If you didn't have the axis modifications in place, it wouldn't be nearly such a big movement. It would be more like this. So it might be a little more comfortable. So you're going to have to play around with that and see, but be aware that the, uh, the more you reduce that Y saturation on your cyclic axes, the longer these throws are going to have to be to make your adjustments in flight, and it's not always a pleasant experience. Alright, so we've hopped into the Mi 8 hip for a moment, so I can show you the way that it should be responding to cyclic roll and how it returns. So we're just going to get ourselves flying ahead here, and to do that I'm just pushing a little bit forward on the cyclic to nose down, and then when I want to stop that I just return it to center and the nose comes right back up. Now I need to retrim again because I'm in forward flight, so we're going to do that. We'll fly along the runway heading here, get ourselves trimmed for basically forward level flight. There, let go. Now if I wanted to bring the nose up, just aft cyclic for a moment and then let it go. And then it'll come back to exactly where it was right away. If I roll the wings left and then let go, they roll back out again right away. Basically the same rate they rolled in the first place. This way, and back. This way, and back. Nose up, and back down. And each time I'm like letting go of the cyclic entirely, and nose down, and back. So unlike the gazelle, it doesn't just kind of stick in place, it returns to the original position at the same rate it moved, it deviated from that position. So to get out of this bank in the gazelle, I would have to push the cyclic across the center point to the right to bring the wings back level at any decent pace. In the hip, I don't. I can just let go, and it will roll out again all by itself, right away at the pace that I expect it to do. So let's jump out into the external cam and maybe we can do a side-by-side -side comparison. So I wanted to touch quickly on variants, because as you'll see in the mission editor, there are four of them for the Gazelle. I don't want to get into detail about what really makes them all different, because that's kind of beyond the scope of this video, but I did want to make the point that what we've learned here today does apply to all four. So you saw me flying the SA-342 Lima, or L, at the beginning of the video, then when I had the webcam on, I had the minigun variant, which has the best cockpit visibility, and then now I'm flying the uh, M, or Mike, variant. Um, so you'll see me fly three of them here and show you that this is the same process for all of them. Uh, finally, I've undone the modifications of the axes, so I'm back to the original very sensitive controls with no desaturation or curves. So this is the M variant, and we're just going to do the exact same thing. Just a tiny bit of right and aft cyclic input, a little bit of right anti-torque, and then we bring our collective up to about 40%, give or take, depending on loadout and wind and so on, to get light on skids. And then as we bring our collective up a little higher than that, we'll lift up off the ground. And it's the same thing, these little tiny inputs with just the fingertip flying here. And my understanding is the M is supposed to be easier to hover. The blades are designed a little bit differently. But it's exactly the same process. Bring in collective till you're light on skids, then a little more to lift up. It's going to be you know, the same amount of right and aft cyclic to uh, keep yourself kind of in a stable hover. And then these tiny little movements around the center point. 
with just fingertip flying. And that's pretty much it. So that's all I'm going to say about variants. I just wanted to show you that this it doesn't really matter which one you're flying. The process to hover them is going to be the same. Very quickly, I'd like to show you auto hover because it is something that you'll be doing in the Gazelle. Uh, so if we get ourselves up into a hover again, we go, I'm just going to point myself into the wind this time. Get yourself into a pretty reasonably stable hover. Um, the important thing being you're not climbing or descending as much as possible. And you're not uh, drifting around too much. Your ground speed is basically zero. And then hit your auto hover button. And the helicopter will sort of take the controls from you. It will center itself. I'm not touching my controls at all anymore. And you'll kind of know it's working because it'll swing back and forth like this. It'll just sort of rock back and forth. And if I jump out into the external cam, it'll just swing back and forth like this in auto hover. So it's pretty easy. You just press the auto hover button, binding whatever that happens to be when you're in a reasonable hover already. Um, not climbing and descending and not drifting around too much. Very low ground speed. And that's it. And then you can focus on whatever else you need to do. Uh, so this is kind of a great stand-in for the fact that there's no multi-crew yet. So you, if you need to jump seats and hop over here, you can do that and then work on aiming or firing missiles or whatever you have. And then to undo it, you just press your auto hover button again and it'll return controls to you. And now it's back to me again. Alright, well, that's how we hover the gazelle. Hopefully that all made sense, and if you guys have questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. Especially if you know more than I do, because I'm by no means an expert on this particular helicopter. So there's a good chance that I missed something, or I got something wrong, and it would be awesome if we could share that with everybody to avoid bad info and negative training, at least as much as possible. I know I'm going to get the question, so I wanted to just talk about it quickly. Uh, am I going to turn this into a full tutorial series? And the answer to that is no, at least not right now. Um, I just don't have the time and or really the drive to learn this helicopter in its current state. The issues that we just talked about a few minutes ago really push me away from it every time I think about really diving into learning it properly. Um, if those could be fixed, the rest of the flight model is pretty serviceable. Uh, everything that I've tried out, and I've spent several hours um, looking at the flight model for the helicopter, it's decent, it's good. It's definitely not as bad as people would have you believe, even if it can do some silly things upside down. <laughs> Stuff that you would expect to be modeled is there, and for the most part, my issues with it, other than the two we talked about today, are little things around the edges, artificial limitations or artificial stability or excess power, that kind of stuff. Things that could be tweaked and improved on and fixed, but uh, the Gazelle is due for a flight model overhaul, so we're just gonna leave it at that. And hopefully this, guys, this video will get you guys in the air and keep you there uh, for the Gazelle in its current state. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.